Warmest greetings to all my incredible subscribers and new viewers alike. Thank you for choosing our video on J. Walter Leopold. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. J. Walter Leopold born Joseph Walter Leopold was an American pianist, songwriter, singer, and comedian from Brooklyn, who entertained audiences in the United States and Canada from the ERS through the early ERS. He started his career in vaudeville, and later moved to radio broadcast performances. In addition to creating new songs for the entertainers he accompanied, Leopold contributed music and lyrics to several published and recorded songs. Get ready for a captivating exploration as we unravel the layers of vaudeville and their profound significance. J. Walter Leopold began his vaudeville career in 1914 as the pianist in the Gorman Brothers and Leopold. He provided the music for the team, but was not just the piano player in the background, he also sang and did comedy. An early review reported that J. Walter and the Gormans all have good voices, and the kind of comedy they put into their act is out of the beaten track. Another critic commented, the comedian of the trio is J. Walter Leopold, and he gives the act a lot of life, and inserts much good humour. Sometime in early 1915, he left the Gormans and disappeared from the theatre ads for a few years. Leopold resurfaced in November 1917, when he and partner Bert Lewis entertained as the Merry Men from Songland. A 1918 review of their act, at the Palace in New Orleans, credits Leopold with being the teen performer outshining his partner Bert Lewis, whose performance cheapens their act. Bite from us upright shortly thereafter, in 1918, he teamed up with Emma Corus, a star in the Ziegfeld Follies and numerous musical comedy hits, a headliner on the Orpheum circuit. Leopold entertained with Corus from late 1918 to early 1925 in the Orpheum theatres, where their act was typically billed as Emma Corus, with J. Walter Leopold singing their own songs. In addition to accompanying Corus during her songs, he would play the piano and sing while she was offstage doing costume changes, and would sometimes get up and dance with her. Because Karis had a somewhat plump figure, critics would sometimes jokingly comment in their articles about how much of a workout Leopold received by lifting her in the dancing routines. In January 1928, Leopold appeared in the Tula Theatre Tula, CA with the Kansas City Night Hawks, America's youngest professional jazz orchestra. In April 1928, he appeared solo at the Madison Theatre in Brooklyn. Leopold continued his association with the Kansas City Night Hawks as their manager. In 1929, he and the band, coming from a swing through the first-class vaudeville houses on the West Coast played nightly in Trenton, NJ, at the Everglades Farms, a restaurant with entertaining and dancing. Later that year, Leopold started working at Everglades Farms regularly, without the Night Hawks, as a master of ceremonies. Now, let's shift our focus to radio and embark on an intellectual exploration of its various dimensions. Left from the upright from September 1926 to late 1930, Leopold worked for radio station KHJ in Los Angeles, where he was known as the Cliff Weller. Here, he would perform 15 to 30 minute programs, playing piano and singing. His shows included both popular tunes and his own compositions. In November 1930, his show was being broadcast in New York on station WOV. Now, let's shift our focus to songwriting and embark on an intellectual exploration of its various dimensions. J. Walter Leopold composed the music for the following. Songs play that Bovin slide trombone 1911 lyrics by Arthur Gillespie I'm floating on an ocean of love 1912 in Dear Old Dixieland 1912 written with Harry L. Newman. Lyrics by Oliver L. Friel's Little by Little 1912 Take Me Back to Dreamland 
Take Me Back with You 1912 written with Olive L. Friels and Harry L. Newman, the Ragthunk Drummer Man 1912, The Razzle Dazzle Glide 1912, What a Wonderful World 1913 written with Jack Brennan Down in Chinatown 1914, Lyrics by J. Casper Nathan Sailing Through the Panama Canal 1914, Lyrics by the Gorman Brothers, The Garden Gate Was Open. My Beautiful Rose Was Gone 1914 Lyrics by J. Ken Brennan I'd Like to Be in Tennessee to Marry the Girl I'd Love 1915 Lyrics by Milton Wheel and Caleb Enix I'm Going Back to Erin to My Sweet Killeny Rose 1915 Lyrics by Wilma Ump Dodda Ump Dodda I the song that my grandmother sang 1915 lyrics by Casper Nathan under the mellow Arabian moon 1915 lyrics by Casper Nathan recorded on a disc by Victor Talking Machine Co. Vocalists Billy Murray and Irving Kaufman plant a little garden in your own backyard 1917 lyrics by Walter Hirsch and Bert Lewis How could I ever forget you beautiful mother of mine 1919 lyrics by Emma Chorus I'm mighty glad to get back to my old hometown 1919 lyrics by Emma Chorus and Travis Bradley My wedding day 1919 lyrics by Emma Chorus Oh how She Can Dance 1919 Lyrics by Emma Chorus John James O'Reilly 1921 Written with Emma Chorus and Herman Conn Has Anybody Seen My Cat? 1922 Written with Emma Chorus and Dan Blanco Is It A Sin? My Loving You 1925 Written with Emma Chorus and Vincent Bryan Recorded on a disc by multiple label chartists Cameo Records featuring Harry Smith Hollywood 1928 First Recording and Sid Gary Hollywood 1928 Second Recording Decca Records featuring The Ink Spots NYC 1941 Capitol Records featuring Duke Ellington and his famous orchestra with Jimmy Grissom Hollywoods Chicago 1953 and Hollywood 1954 My Pal and Me 1927 written with Fahrenheit Lang Henry Carver You Wouldn't Fool a Friend 1927 Bluebird Time 1941 Lyrics by J. Ken Brennan I'll Take Care of Your Cares 1952 Written with Thomas J. Tobin Rose of Spain 1953 Movie Soundtrack Sweepstake Annie 1935 Composer of Babbling Tongues and Country Folk Moving forward, we'll be taking a closer look at early life Joseph Walter Leopold was born 27 July 1890 in Brooklyn, New York, to Frank Leopold, a factory cloth examiner, and Anne Sutter Leopold, both originally from Germany. He lived in Brooklyn with his parents and younger brother, J. William, until the early years. In 1911, he married Gertrude Ethel McNally, and by 1913 they had relocated to Chicago, I.L. The Leopolds had one daughter, Ethel Reed Leopold, born 2 July 1914, while J. Walter was still working with the Gorman brothers. He divorced Gertrude in late January 1922, during the time he was performing with Emma Chorus. With the groundwork laid, let's now examine with Emma Chorus and its connections to our previous discussions. On 4 August 1922, Leopold and his partner Emma Chorus appeared in Chicago's The Daily News. In a story regarding Chorus sentencing in a disorderly conduct case, the case concerned her involvement in the fight that Leopold allegedly started with songwriter Harry Newman whom he had composed music with earlier in his career. The fight at the Hotel Sherman in Chicago apparently started as a result of hotel guests, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Rinaldo, telling Leopold that Newman had called him an unpleasant name. According to Mr. and Mrs. Newman's testimony, Leopold entered their hotel room behind Chorus, who had called ahead to have a chat with Mr. Newman. It was reported that both Chorus and Leopold had been drinking. Leopold was said to have shouted, Now I've got you where I want you, and began hitting Newman over the head and the shoulders, while Chorus urged Leopold to give it to him right and left, as she struggled with Mrs. Newman to keep her from calling for help. In April 1926, Leopold and Chorus married in Glendale, CA. However, the union did not last longitude only 23 days later. Chorus filed for divorce, citing cruelty as the grounds. Shortly after their split, in October 1926, Chorus, whose health had been declining, was declared mentally incompetent and was committed to Casa del Mar Sanitarium in Los Angeles. 
She died there on 18 November 1927. Brace yourself for an in-depth analysis as we navigate through Eta and Estate and its far-reaching implications. Soon after Kara's death, it was revealed that Leopold's divorce from Kara's had never been finalized, and he was now an Eta her estate, which totaled approximately $165,000 equivalent to about $2.40 million in 2019. In November 1926, soon after Karras' internment, Leopold had started his action to set aside the divorce, asserting that he had been asked by friends not to oppose the divorce because of Miss Karras' condition. Karras' interlocutory decree of divorce, which didn't terminate the marriage until after a year had elapsed and a final decree obtained, had basically been pre-empted by her death, so the divorce never became final. Leopold, as administrator of the Karras estate, had to contend with several issues impacting his pending inheritance. First, he had to dispute the claim that Karras housekeeper, Lydia A. McCann, was owed $36,000 back pay, which the housekeeper asserted was retained by Karras for investment purposes. Second, his ex-wife Gertrude McNally Leopold filed a lawsuit against him to collect over $10,000 in unpaid alimony. Third, Karras' nieces from Germany, the daughters of her half-sister, also filed claims on the estate. McCann was inarguably the person most damaging to Leopold's claim to the estate. Leopold disputed the claim that Karras agreed to pay the maid a $25 weekly salary plus lodging, as it was already a third of what Karras herself was taking in weekly, before expenses. In McCann's depositions, she claimed she was more than just a housekeeper to Karras during her years of service and was more a companion, confidant, and manager of Karras' household and personal property. She stated that Leopold was aware Karras, who suffered from passes, was having frequent attacks of insanity, and that one day he took Karras out for a short ride, taking advantage of the opportunity to marry her quickly without allowing McCann or others to intervene. In April 1928, Paul Schnitzler was made co-administrator of the Karras estate by recommendation of Dr. Gustav Heuser, German consul in New York City, acting on behalf of Karras' five nieces of half-blood, with agreement from J. Walter Leopold. Schnitzler had heard McCann's depositions even before Leopold became administrator of the estate, and used the information on the marriage as leverage to compel Leopold to agree to his appointment as co-administrator reportedly under threat to have the marriage annulled, and to let the German heirs receive 60% of the estate, while Leopold took 40%. Of this 40%, Leopold was to give 15% to Leon Thurber, friend and guardian of Karras in her last years and whatever amount was to be settled with his ex-wife for the back alimony lawsuit. McCann initially was pressured to ask for a smaller sum of $2,500 for her settlement in order to avoid another $10,000 in court costs, but when those costs were waived by the courts, McCann was emboldened to ask for more. In November 1930, Leopold consented to have Schnitzler offer her $9,000. McCann turned this down and negotiated with Schnitzler to accept a payment of $12,000, which Leopold refused to pay. By this time, about $7,500 in court costs had already been expended in court battles with McCann and her lawyers. In her judgment against Leopold, former wife Gertrude McNally Leopold claimed that J. Walter Leopold paid alimony for only two years, then disappeared and left her and their daughter stranded in Chicago. Leopold denied the claims that he owed her back alimony of $175 per month, and asserted that he had made a settlement with his first wife which had been satisfactory until the news of the Karras estate was published. Karras half-nieces, led by Elizabeth Blose and Anna Matthews, argued that their aunt was insane when she married Leopold, and filed suit in a federal court to have their aunt's marriage voided. Leopold had stated that Karras told him she had no relatives in the US or in Germany. The settlement of the Karras estate was not finalized until some time in early 1932, and the outcome was not published in the local papers. The papers did note that ex-guardian Leon Thurber was to collect 
$300 as her part of the estate when it was still under final settlement in January 1932. If the earlier conditions of the estate were upheld, this implies that Leopold had received roughly $15,300. In this section, we'll be shedding light on later life and its impact on our understanding of the subject. In May 1933, Leopold went into business with his brother J. William Leopold, opening the Blue Point Inn, a resort in Brooklyn. The resort advertised fishing, bathing, entertainment, and dancing, with a nightly rate of $3 and a weekly rate of $18. In the 1936 C. Evota registration list and the 1937 City Directory for Los Angeles, Leopold was listed as a salesman. By 1937, Leopold had married his third wife, Helen, formerly Clara Helen Ennis, originally Clara Helen Peel of Illinois. In the 1940 census, he listed his occupation as actor. In 1942, his WWII draft registration card indicated he was a store's protection assistant in L.A. At the time of his death, he was described as being an investigator for loan and credit companies and a songwriter. Moving on to the next segment, we have death. Left Framilus Upright Left Framilus Upright J. Walter Leopold, at age 66, was killed while trying to stop a holdup in a Hollywood market. On 28 December 1956, a masked gunman, Charles Fahrenheit, Neely, and his getaway driver, Norman Goland, both prison parolees, were holding up a market at 1921 North. Cahuinga Boulevard in Hollywood, which was just 0.4 miles from Leopold's home. In an attempt to incapacitate Neely and break up the robbery, Leopold threw a can of enchilada sauce to stop the gunman and struck him in the face. In retaliation, Neely shot Leopold in the temple with a 0.38 caliber bullet and fled with about $50 in stolen cash. Leopold died minutes after arriving at Hollywood Receiving Hospital. Neely and Golan were later apprehended. In June 1957, Neely was sentenced to life imprisonment, while Golan, who had waited in the parking lot in a light green sedan, received a sentence of five years to life. If you found this video helpful, give it a like and share it with someone who might benefit from it.